So we are delighted that ASC asked us to not only uh, prepare this document on recommendations, but also uh, present this webinar. So we'll share some of our thoughts with you, and it won't be a complete, uh, complete repetition of everything that's written in the uh, document. But we will just go over the various applications of echocardiography in rheumatic heart disease. And I'm trying to go full screen. And on second, I'll be there with you. There we go. And as we go along, in terms of disclosure uh, relevant to this talk uh, is listed here. I speak for the lengthiest company sometimes. Poor Dr. Kim has no disclosure to announce. Now, nothing happens uh, just by one or two people. Uh, a big writing group was prepared for this one. And so the names are listed there. And you can, as you can see, it's from a variety of regions, various countries, and multiple continents. Almost all of them have experience in rheumatic heart disease. There are a good number of people from Asian area where it's much more common and also uh, in South America. And I want to also thank for the uh, ASC guideline committee who first sent us the invitations and also the ASC staff who took us through various levels a preparation of the document and now webinar. And a uh, special thanks goes to Liz uh, with reference to this webinar because she put in a lot of work in this area. Every level uh, of uh, AAC staff helped us. And uh, so it's a teamwork for multiple people. And this document uh, has been endorsed by a variety of countries, uh, country associations, and uh, uh, who are all alliance partners, international alliance partners with ASC. So the learning objectives, the hope is by the end of this presentation, the viewer will be better able to understand the pathoanatomic abnormalities of various rheumatic valvular lesions, hemodynamic derangements of various valvular lesions, and how we can employ quantitative parameters uh, to assess rheumatic valve lesions and the clinical implications of this particular uh, findings. Now, I will take you through a small tour or a journey and a, a, a few words about disease evolution, and then talk a little bit about rheumatic carditis various valve lesions we'll go through, looking at the pathoanatomy, hemodynamics, and chamber function. And also end with how echocardiography could be employed to guide therapy. And what you see on the right side are the various modalities of echocardiography uh, that are useful, and we'll go through that also pointing out uh, uh, some of the pitfalls, uh, but emphasizing on the technical aspects as we go along. One thing worth keeping in mind, uh, this is the guidelines and recommendations. Like any guidelines or recommendations, not all items in the guidelines are thoroughly validated. Many uh, occasions where we just have to come to a consensus and think that's the best way to go. And so a lot of, not a lot, many of it are based on consensus expert opinions. The recommendations here should be considered and applied in the appropriate clinical setting. As we know, the patient is more than an echocardiogram. And so we have to put the clinical symptoms and signs and also other associated disorders in case they would influence them. That is how one has to interpret these guidelines and recommendations. For that matter, 
any guidelines or recommendations. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kim to talk about the pathophysiology. Okay, so we're going to briefly review the pathophysiology of rheumatic heart disease. Uh, rheumatic heart disease is a long-term consequence of acute rheumatic fever, which is caused by immune or autoimmune-mediated injury following an infection by group A, beta-hemolytic streptococcus, otherwise known as strep pyogens. Um, acute rheumatic fever can present with a variety of symptoms, including skin findings, chorea, um, arthritis, but carditis is the most common feature, and valvulitis is the most consistent feature of acute rheumatic carditis. The most common presentation of acute valvulitis is mitral or aortic valve regurgitation. So let's go over a little bit of the echocardiographic findings of acute rheumatic valvulitis. Um, within the appropriate clinical setting, uh, you will see broadly two types of findings on echo um, in a patient with acute rheumatic fever and carditis. Uh, one of the things that we would observe is the caudal abnormality. There can be caudal lengthening or even tear. On the leaflet itself, there may be some nodular thickening, uh, especially on the free edge of the leaflet. These abnormalities can lead to flail anterior, often anterior leaflet of the mitral leaflet that is shown here as an example. And that could also be associated with a significant uh, mitral regurgitation. Sometimes we might be able to get a better morphology uh, on a 3D echocardiogram, as you see on this unfos view. You can see the nodular beading pattern uh, on the free leaflet on the uh, edge of the mitral valve here. So a few things to remember about acute uh, rheumatic valvulitis, echocardiographic findings of valvulitis is a major criterion of acute rheumatic fever. Um, this may be actually used to diagnose subclinical uh, rheumatic carditis. Regurgitation and nodular thickening are more common in the acute phase in contrast to diffuse thickening um, or commissure uh, fusions or stenotic lesions that we typically see in the chronic phase. If you are measuring valve thickness, it should be measured with a harmonic imaging up. Now, uh, to talk about the mitral stenosis, which is the hallmark of the rheumatic heart disease, I'm going to send it back to Dr. Pandian. Thank you. That was a good introduction to the whole uh, pathology. You know, everybody gets a sore throat, uh, particularly children all over the world, but a uh, small cohort. Uh, Though them go on to develop uh, rheumatic uh, fever and rheumatic carditis. And so that is why the pathophysiology uh, is important. Now, mitral stenosis, the most common uh, uh, problem in rheumatic heart disease and in the world. There are other reasons for mitral stenosis, but this is the commonest pathology. And uh, chronic lesion, first after many years after rheumatic fever and rheumatic carditis, the mitral stenosis evolves. And depending on where one lives in countries, uh, many countries in Asia, it can affect even at a juvenile stage. In countries like uh, uh, United States, usually we see them uh, pass in people past 40 years and even 50, 60 and so forth. Now, the characteristic features are depicted here. These are still frames. Valve thickening is important. And there is a commissural fusion, as you see in this slide, as the arrows point out. And the leaflet thickening in the picture on the right top uh, is first primarily at the tips. And uh, the commissural fusion and the valve thickening at the tips leads to this kind of appearance 
where the belly of the valve leaflets may not be that terribly thick in early stages unless it's a chronic process where the whole leaflet could be thickened and involved. And where in diastole, when the mitral valve opens, there is often a diastolic doming, as the arrow shows, and mostly in the anterior leaflet, Occasionally, even the posterior leaflet can show some doming. So this simply, the diastolic doming simply indicates that the belly of the valve is in, uh, not that terribly fibrotic, while the tips are often fibrotic and the orifice is narrow. And then another thing we have to look at is the subvalvular structures. Looking at the caudal structures, and, the, uh, and the, the whole subvalvular apparatus. It might not only they are thickened, they could be shortened. And this kind of a finding does have implications in creating the pathophysiologic consequences and also in the management therapeutic guidance uh, when we try treat this condition, uh, treat this. And here are again, uh, uh, the commercial fusion example, and shown here on the bottom is this nice video. You can see the valve orifice area is reduced, and the commissures are somewhat uh, fused. And in the it's a long axis you see the doming, and the, here is a short axis image close to the tips. And this valve thickening we talked about, uh, the doming indicates a pliable valve, which is good. Uh, but in chronic cases, this fibrotic process might involve not only the tips, but all the whole meat of the leaflets. And then you may not see any diastolic doming. And uh, so it's a pliable valve. If one is doing a clinical exam, uh, this is a kind of a scenario that would be associated with uh, opening snap. If the whole valve is chronically inflamed and fibrotic and calcific, one may not actually hear any opening snap. In this picture here, we also see a large left atrium that tells us the gradient across the mitral valve is going to be high. And we can even gauge that there's either right-sided valve involvement, such as a tricuspid valve, or more often uh, pulmonary hypertension causing right ventricular dilation and dysfunction. Restricted valve motion, and what people call a hockey stick, I like to call it just doming of the leaflet, the classic features. And a caudal thickening, the other one we mentioned. These are all things we have to anal analyze whether we are doing a transthoracic echo or a transesophageal echo. How about associated finding? As we saw in the previous example, left atrial size matters. And as the pressure in the left atrium goes up because of the obstruction, the left atrial enlargement progressively gets worse. And if the right atrium is not involved, the interatrial septum will be bowing to a great deal towards the right. Another one we have to look for is any thrombi or clot present in the body of the left atrium or in the left atrial appendage. Or sometimes just a dense sludge, spontaneous echo contrast. Uh, most important is actually uh, whether there's a well-formed thrombus or not. And uh, uh, that, that is one aspect, uh, a consequence of uh, mitral stenosis that we have to examine. And as the patient develops pulmonary hypertension because of high left atrial pressure, uh, that will affect the right heart and so the right ventricular size, right ventricular function, and the right atrial size, these all need to be examined both qualitatively and quantitatively. Now, while the ma majority of cases, the predominant lesion is mitral stenosis, 
there could be multiple valves involved. So either two valvular disease, uh, for example, mitral stenosis and aortic stenosis, or even there have been occasional cases, even all four valves are involved. Rare, but it does occur. So systematically, one got to look at the mitral valve, the aortic valve, the tricuspid valve, and pulmonic valve also when we do the echo examination. Now, in terms of severity, as a valve gets narrowed, the gradient goes up. And here is a table that's in the uh, document and uh, uh, kind of grading the severity, if you say mild, moderate, and severe. The consensus is if the valve area is decreased, but it's still more than 2.5, uh, we are talking about the anatomic valve area that's likely to be mild. And if it's 1.5 or less, uh, it's severe. And in between is a moderate category. And likewise, pressure half time, which I will show you an example shortly. Uh, if the pressure half time that uh, is more than 150, and we'll see it in the next example, uh, that means it's severe. But if it's less than 100, it's mild. In between, is moderate. And then the gradient. You know, a gradient, it's more than equal to or more than 10. The mitral stenosis is considered to be severe. If it's five or less, mild. In between, is moderate. Now, one thing when we talk about gradients, we have to always keep in mind it also depends on the flow and flow rate. Uh, uh, and so gradient should always be interpreted in the setting of flow status. Now, yeah, as the case progresses, one develops pulmonary uh, hypertension. So severe pulmonary hypertension would be equal to 50 or more. Mild is close to normal stage and moderate is somewhere in between. But anytime we look at any of these things, particularly the gradient, besides the flow status, another thing we have to keep in mind is the heart rate. The heart rate is fast, you know, there's less time uh, to uh, fill. And so the gradient sometimes may not be that high, but we have to consider the uh, heart rate also. Now, planimetry, that's a fundamental problem uh, causing symptoms. That's a reduced orifice area. Parasternal short axis generally would give you a nice present, a nice depiction of the, the smallest area. And uh, one of the key things is to trace at the right level, right angle. Otherwise, in a pliable valve, we might get uh, bigger. Uh, valve area and uh, get a nice quality get a nice quality echo image and when necessary use a zoom mode or decrease the depth whatever that works anything that will define the mitral valve anatomy nicely could be just cut down the sector size and so forth to bring out that pathology now this slide just shows uh, how when we do the short axis, to get a short axis, the accurate method would be the short, in the short axis imaging plane should go through the tips. Okay. And then we'll get the valve area at that site. And as you see in the schematic and the left side line or the imaging plane number one goes through the tips. It's a small valve area, but in a valve that's playable and doming, we get a short axis somewhere in the middle of the valve, middle of the belly of the valve, the valve area might be bigger. This is a common mistake. How do we do that? You know, get a short axis, tilt the transducer below the level of the mitral valve, slowly, gently tilt up, where we get the complete orifice at the tips. Uh, this is an important technical factor. 
Of course, 3D echo, uh, here's a beautiful image of the synodic mitral valve. On the left side is seen from above the left atrium and the right side from the left ventricle. Uh, nice image. Besides depicting the site and shape of the mitral valve orifice, we can also use a three-dimensional imaging, biplane or multiplanar imaging to align this valve area level uh, depiction or uh, to align the cursor at the very tips so that we would not miss out uh, the truly uh, true severity of the mitral valve. And shouldn't use too much gain, then it can just creep into the valve orifice. Not too little gain, there could be dropouts and one might miss uh, measure that particular area. Now, the basically pressure half time in a way reflects the uh, uh, gradient and how it behaves during diastole. Here is a, a schematic showing left ventricular tracing and another schematic showing left atrial pressure tracing uh, in a patient with mitral stenosis. So a gradient is established. Now, the decay in pressure or decay in pressure gradient is faithfully depicted by this Doppler exam, uh, pulse Doppler, CW Doppler, preferably a CW Doppler. So once you have a nice profile and generally recorded from the apex, then as we see on the right side, we take the peak velocity and then wait for the pressure difference to decline by half. And the easy way to do that in Doppler is Vmax divided by 1.4. That gives the pressure half time. While it does not give you the real pressure, uh, but it tells us the behavior of the hemodynamics during diastole. And, uh, uh, and then we kind of measure that pressure half time. Nowadays, uh, the instrument uh, of the software uh, once you trace and uh, it, it gives you the pressure half time. Now, broadly put or simply put, if the stenosis is severe, the pressure is going to, uh, LA pressure is going to remain high uh, most, of, uh, most of diastole. Uh, if the stenosis is not that severe, there might be an early gradient and the left atrial pressure will come down uh, fast as the flow goes into the LV and fills the LV. So on a broad level, longer the pressure half time, more severe is a valve. Here is uh, kind of a little summary of what hemodynamics we have to measure. And uh, one is the mean pressure gradient, and then calculation of the mitral valve area by pressure half time. And of course, we try to estimate the left atrial, right atrial pressure, uh, as well as uh, uh, interpreting them in the setting of the cardiac rhythm and heart rate. And uh, the calculation of a mitral valve area in the pressure half time uh, is good, but it could also be easily affected by other disorders such as aortic valve disease, severe aortic regurgitation, or LV diastolic dysfunction, they can affect the pressure half time determination. Color Doppler just shows the flow convergence in a synoptic area where a lot of isovelocity shells are formed. Uh, adjust the gain so that you see them the best. And uh, so this just tells us, uh, including the vena contractor, you know, where the flow is and how small the flow jet is. But we have to keep in mind, it's not a circular orifice. And so uh, one may have to look at it in many different views. There have been approaches to use the PSAR technique to measure the flow also. 
But in mitral stenosis, it's a little tough unless you do 3D imaging of the proximal isovelocity surface area. Now, CW, besides measuring the gradient, and we also employ to assess the pressure half time. Now, this example shows that not they are not always smooth, like the previous one we saw. It's a very steady decline in the velocity. But here in this example, there is a steep slope. This is through transesophageal echo. And then there is a shallow slope. And then one has a question, what do I measure? Where do I go from where to where? And in this kind of a situation, go by the major portion of diastolic profile rather than drawing and uh, drawing that from the early diastole onwards. So you can extend that major slope further to the beginning, and that would be the appropriate one. Now, this is relatively common. Uh, what happens then if it's equal, this equal, you know, one slope is like this, another slope is like that. What do we do then? And then uh, the answer for that is no answer, really. Uh, what uh, I would suggest is in, if it's really two halves are equal, then just go from the beginning to the end. And but it but again, we are not going to relate just on the pressure half time in this scenario, look at the mitral valve gradients and go from there. So gradients, pressure half time, uh, derived valve area. And then what happened? Some patients with a uh, low flow state, low output state. In a majority of patients, a patient symptoms will correlate with a mean pressure gradient, and that will correlate with a, a smaller valve area. But there are occasions there could be a discordance, discordance between symptoms, the other objective data, uh, discordance between the pressure gradient and mitral valve area. Very often, they are in a scenario of low output state, but they could be in a high output state also. So common problem being a low cardiac output state. In these scenarios, one can employ exercise hemodynamics. Exercise could be just alternate leg raising when you're doing an echo, or it could be uh, sit-ups, up and down, up and down, or a well-structured exercise, such as a treadmill, uh, supine bicycle, uh, exercise uh, would be useful. Occasionally, we can use a dobutamine stress also if the patient is not able to do any exercise. Uh, my personal bias is doing a supine bicycle because it allows you to look at not only the gradient, what happens, uh, but also what happens to the TR velocity and the pulmonary artery pressure. So exercise testing in a patient who appears to be asymptomatic at rest is extremely valuable in determining the true severity of mitral stenosis. And uh, I would even say uh, an exam echo examination of a patient with mitral stenosis with low gradient is not complete unless one does some form of exercise to quote unquote normalize the flow and remeasure the gradient. Now, uh, that's what the first lines, uh, two lines say. So, main gradient, if it goes up to 15 or more, uh, either during exercise or dobutamine stress echo, uh, that indicates a significant rheumatic mitral stenosis. And also, putting the patient's symptoms and this objective data, uh, that also identifies who might benefit from intervention. One point to make about uh, symptoms is that, you know, because it's a chronic, slowly progressive disease, patients are, adjust themselves. So they might tell you, no, I'm fine. 
But on the other hand, if you do an exercise, then you will find out how limited they are. Uh, so overall, mitral stenosis, common lesion, most of the time it's easy to estimate, I diagnose and estimate the severity, but one always has to use a comprehensive approach, uh, patient symptoms, uh, uh, physical exam, and then anatomy of the valve and subvalvular structures, and then the uh, gradients and pulmonary hypertension and all the hemodynamic facets. This just summarizes what we already said. Leaflet thickening, commissural fusion, restricted leaflet motion, caudal thickening or calcification. <coughs> These are key points, which is what we mentioned already. Uh, key points and recommendations, just emphasizing and repeating uh, what we talked about during the examination. And planimetry is generally considered to be the preferred method for getting anatomic malaria. After all, that's what causes all the other problems. <coughs> Smallest malaria, optimized gain setting, and uh, leaflets, and when needed, use a zoom mode. Okay. Now, rhythm and rate are extremely important during Doppler assessment. So uh, that has to be uh, borne in mind. And it just says linear mid-diastolic slope uh, if the mitral flow profile is bimodal. Stress echo, we already uh, stressed on that enough. Whenever, particularly when there's a discordance between patient symptoms and what we see objectively. 15 millimeter of mercury or more during exercise echo. There are sometimes different opinions. To me, even if it goes up to 12, I think it's significant. But overall, uh, we don't rely on one particular parameter, uh, but take all the other variables. Now, I'll turn it over to Dr. Kim to talk about valve regurgitation. Thank you. So we're going to talk in general of the rheumatic valve regurgitation. Um, the valvular regurgitation in the setting of a patient who has a rheumatic heart disease is considered to have a primary rheumatic regurgitation valve when you see, in general, two findings at least two morphological features of a rheumatic valve in the absence of other etiologies and pathological regurgitation. And that is shown in the picture on the right. When you look at the top two panels, uh, panel A, parasol long axis view, you are um, seeing the doming of the typical mitral, uh, rheumatic mitral valve that we see as well as the nodularity and restricted posterior leaflet. In panel B with the apical four chamber view, uh, there is also associated uh, finding of enlarged left atrium. That is in association with the significant mitral regurgitation in panel C with the collar jet, uh, taking up the space, almost all the space of already enlarged left atrium. And this MR, according to the CW Doppler, you can see that it's a pan systolic uh, flow that has a very defined border on the profile. So in general, when we are considering the hemodynamic um, Doppler findings of a uh, rheumatic regurgitant valve, the same principles uh, from the previously published uh, ACE recommendation on native valve regurgitation apply. Um, we try to be as quantitative as possible and avoid um, subjective or, or estimation uh, evaluation. So those quantitative indices are um, effective regurgitation orifice area, regurgitation volume, and regurgitation fraction. Um, one of the semi-quantitative parameters that can be very useful is a vena contracta on 2D echo with a color doppler on. 
And if you're using 3D uh, echo imaging, you can also get a, a, a vena contracta area by 3D echo on color Doppler, by um, modifying the multiplanar imaging, putting the uh, imaging plane right at the level of leaflet tip so we can actually see the regurgitation orifice in color. Uh, moving on to rheumatic aortic valve disease. Um, the rheumatic aortic valve will have a similar findings uh, as mitral uh, valve, uh, which include commissural fusion, fibroidic thickening, and retraction of the leaflet edges. And an example is shown here. You can see this trileaflet aortic valve with very much thickened leaflet edges. Uh, you might be able to sort of appreciate um, a little bit of commissural thickening. And also there is an associated finding of uh, bilateral um, atrial enlargement, which is quite severe. And uh, the patient might have a, a little bit of um, RV systolic dysfunction as well. Um, T can be very helpful to make sure that the short axis view that we are using to get a valve area by planimetry can be optimally positioned as Dr. Pandian alluded to before. Um, so using the uh, biplanar mode, we have to <clears throat> make sure that the cutting imaging cutting plane is at the imaging of uh, the valvular tip, right, where the yellow line would be, and try to avoid putting the imaging plane uh, within the dome leaflet. And this red line, if your plane is there, you might overestimate the valve area. So a few key points to remember when we are assessing rheumatic aortic valve is that uh, commissural fusion and thickening of the free, uh, free edges can help you identify that there is a rheumatic involvement of the aortic valve. Uh, in this case, almost always, there might be uh, typical findings found on the mitral side as well. Doppler assessment of the rheumatic uh, aortic stenosis and regurgitation should follow the same principles from the previous recommendation on native valvular disease. Dr. Pandian will uh, go over the tricuspid valve. Thank you. <clears throat> After the mitral valve, the most commonly involved valve in rheumatic valve disease is a tricuspid valve. And the evolution of a pathology is similar to mitral stenosis. There is the, uh, in this case, it's a two commissures, there'll be more commissures, uh, three commissures. But again, thickening predominantly at the tips and there is some doming we see on the left on the left sided uh, clip uh, pointed out by this arrow and in contrast to a mitral stenosis uh, enormous amount of calcium or a fibrosis doesn't occur in tricuspid valve but it can in some patients uh, beautiful 3d image of the tricuspid valve Again, it allows us uh, to employ uh, multiplanar imaging if we want to get the valve area at the very tips, very similar to the mitral valve. Now, how about the gradients? Now, in general, we record the Doppler and adjusting everything properly. And then the uh, mean gradient, that's very useful piece of information. And if it's atrial fib, average many beats. And, uh, and then the pressure half time. The pressure half time in tricuspid valve has not been extremely well validated, but it is, uh, you can use it as an adjuvant approach. And uh, in terms of the mean gradient, it depends on the flow state. And so one has to look at uh, the pathology of the tricuspid valve well. If it's a five millimeters of mercury gradient or more, that would be significant for a tricuspid valve in contrast to the mitral valve. And we look at every anatomic features as we discussed, leaflets and the commercial fusion and uh, subvalvular structures. And then of course the anatomic valve area and the consequence on right atrium uh, in particular. Any clots occurring there, we got to go through. 
And uh, so among these three, mean gradient and tricuspid valve area are probably more reliable rather than the pressure half time. And 3D echo uh, gives you a multiplanar images. These are uh, uh, some clips. And this patient has both mitral stenosis, as you see, but also tricuspid stenosis, diastolic doming. And uh, it's a mixed lesion. There's not only stenosis, there's also significant tricuspid regurgitation along with right atrial enlargement superimposed on the left atrial enlargement. And this is a kind of a summary and looking at other findings. One is whether there is any systolic flow reversal in hepatic vein, and uh, that would indicate severe tricuspid regurgitation. And the inflow velocity, e wave velocity, would be higher if there's significant TR. And any CW imaging, the intensity of the signals is important. In regurgitation, it's correlated with the severity. Now, let's also go on about mixed valve disease. And mixed valve disease could be a, a problem and complicated, supposing there's a concurrent aortic stenosis and mitral stenosis. Uh, one has to look if the tight mitral stenosis, then the flow going through the aortic valve might be decreased uh, because of uh, restriction in the cardiac output. So we have to interpret it in that particular scenario. Dobutamine, one can give to assess moderate or severe AS. Uh, but if it's due to significant MS, that may not help because the low flow is because of the mitral stenosis. Anatomic valve area is preferred, including the subvalvular structures uh, to determine the severity of all synodic lesions. Now, what about mitral stenosis and aortic regurgitation? And we gotta be careful that we are recording the correct profile. And uh, usually uh, mitral stenosis flow begins after the valve opens, while aortic regurgitation starts earlier and also it lasts longer. And so it, mitral, mitral stenosis flow is primarily during the filling phase, but AR can start early and end late and the velocity generally will be higher. But if they are both are moderate, you know, there's AR is moderate, AS is moderate, then one can apply continuity equation and look at the mean gradient, but if there are two moderate lesions, that's as good as one severe lesion. And so overall in mixed valve disease, we have to employ uh, semi-quantitative or volumetric quantification of the regurgitation and the valve stenosis area and gradients as we talked about for stenosis. And uh, as I said, two moderate lesions is bad, is bad. One or two points about technical aspects. And uh, generally, harmonic imaging uh, is not recommended. You can use it. But what happens, harmonic imaging makes everything bright and strong. And so assessment of valve thickening may not be that easy. So fundamental imaging is suggested. And also uh, adjusting the depth of the scan and the sector width are useful and position the focus at the level of the valve being inspected, whether mitral or aortic. Zoom function, if it's a decent quality study, would be helpful. And one of the most important things is uh, gain setting and dynamic range. And uh, that would help us in recognizing the border definition and recognition. Multiple windows, of course, for the Doppler and uh, post exercise imaging in people uh, when things are not clear cut and treadmill or other forms of exercise. Supine is bicycle is preferred. And then here are a few pointers on pulmonary hypertension. Dr. Kim will discuss this. 
So pulmonary hypertension is actually one of the most important consequences of rheumatic heart disease. Um, and echocardiography allows us to um, evaluate the extent of pulmonary hypertension non-invasively. When we are um, assessing for potential pulmonary hypertension, one of the things that we would include in our echocardiography evaluation is estimating the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. And we try to be quantitative as possible when we are also analyzing the right heart size and function. For using the TR velocity to estimate the PA systolic pressure, we need to avoid the peak um, TR velocity that comes after uh, a premature ectopic beat. And um, when the Doppler spectral envelope of the peak TR velocity is not well visualized, contrast, echo contrast or agitated saline may be helpful. Uh, moving on to echocardiographic evidence, uh, I'm sorry, guidance for intervention. Um, percutaneous balloon mitral valvuloplasty, an example is shown here on the floor to the right, is the treatment of choice for symptomatic rheumatic mitrosinosis. Um, this is a procedure where the inflated balloon will um, open uh, the fused commissures and enlarge the valve area. Um, therefore, moderate or severe mitral regurgitation is a contraindication for this procedure. Uh, PBMV is considered successful if, uh, in the end, the valve area is larger than 1.5 centimeters squared or greater, um, and with no more than uh, two plus mitral regurgitation. Uh, one of the other contraindication for the valvuloplasty is intracardiac thrombus. Therefore, um, the variable plastic should be postponed until the resolution of left atrial or appendage clot. The morphological um, information that we would need to assess to see if the variable plastic will be success or the prognostic features are the following. Um, we would assess the degree of thickening and calcification of leaflets and commissures. Um, extent and symmetry of commissural fusion, severity of subvalvular caudal thickening, shortening and fusion, and the MR and cause we already mentioned. During the procedure, one of the things that ECHO can provide is the guidance to the transeptal puncture. On the left picture, uh, this is a, a short axis view where you see the aorta and the interatrial septum is tented because the, um, the transeptal needle is positioned at this point. And this view will allow us to make sure that the puncture is away from the aorta, not anteriorly directed. And you could also have a, um, a, a 3D view where you make sure the, the puncture is within the foramen. Uh, during the procedure, uh, the TE, especially 3D uh, guidance can be very helpful in positioning the catheter itself. And on the picture on the right, you're seeing success uh, uh, pictures of the catheter being positioned in the middle of the mitral valve and eventually being inflated. Immediately post-inflation, uh, the echo would also be used to assess the transmitral pressure gradient and uh, get a valve area by planimetry to uh, evaluate the success of the procedure. We should also keep in mind that the valve area calculation by pressure half time is not recommended immediately after uh, uh, balloon um, mitral plasty. And also uh, screen for potential complications, cardiac tamponade uh, or accumulation of Pericardial effusion that wasn't there before, or acute and severe mitral regurgitation post inflation. Uh, so, uh, going back to Dr. Pandian, he's going to wrap up this talk. Okay, uh, <clears throat> this is the summary of summary slide of what we talked. 
uh, echo is a primary tool for assessing abnormalities and valve lesions associated with rheumatic heart disease. And uh, not only we see the pathoanatomic abnormalities uh, of both carditis and valvular lesions, echo is an extremely uh, valuable tool as well as on hemodynamic and flow disorders and a critical guide to making and directing the therapeutic interventions. One of the things you might have noticed that we did not give any particular score system to assess the mitral valve anatomy for interventions, uh, simply because there are lots of different score systems, but they all basically talk about the degree of valvular thickening, uh, commercial fusion, symmetric or asymmetric fusion, and the amount of calcium, and if there is more than any mitral regurgitation. These are the things one has to look for. So it's fun to do echo on patients with mitral stenosis. There are many tools and uh, we would uh, be able to take some questions uh, that you already submitted. And we want to thank you for listening to us. And at this point, uh, let's go for some questions. Yeah, so we have some questions from the audience. Um... So let's take the one. This is uh, it says that uh, why in some patients your leaflet appears to prolapse. How do we differentiate if there is also thickening? Okay, uh, most of the time that kind of a prolapse appearance one will see uh, if the valve is pliable. Uh, if the valve is not pliable and markedly thickened, you won't see that. And even when what appears to be kind of a reverse doming, if you will, uh, that never exceeds the mitral annular level, very rarely. And the caudal structures will be intact. So in this scenario, uh, unless there's significant mitral regurgitation, most of the thing that's important is to uh, look at the degree of mitral stenosis and all the other aspects we already mentioned. And uh, so that is not a true prolapse like a, the other one. It's just a pliable mitral valve. Um, there is also another question. Um, while grading mitral stenosis, do we use the same criteria for both rheumatic mitral stenosis and functional mitral stenosis? Um, what, what is functional mitral stenosis? I'm trying to understand. Uh, I think, what, the, okay. what I do think, you think the audience might be asking maybe um, mitral stenosis that was included in the uh, previous guideline, but really uh, for primary mitral stenosis, the most predominant process is the rheumatic heart disease. So uh, in this case, um, most of if you look at historically the data that were used to um, include to be included in the um, the the guideline for the uh, native valve stenosis, most of those uh, were derived from the rheumatic patients with a mitral stenosis. So, well, what's the next question we have? Um, I like this question because it's actually getting at the heart of maybe using the multimodality and drawing the overall picture. So one question was, um, when grading the valve area of less than 2.5 as moderate, and if we calculate the area by per half time, uh, per half time of 100 milliseconds in this case, and that gives you 2.2 centimeter square valve area, which you would also be considered moderate, um, if the pressure half time of 100 millisecond is mild and you get a valve area of 2.2, can you explain what do we report in this scenario? Okay, of, of all the measurement approaches we discussed, uh, probably relatively speaking, the least reliable is pressure half time method. So in the situation you mentioned, sir, I would uh, go more by the anatomic valve area and not use pressure half time. Next question. All right, we have two minutes left. So uh, the next question is, a patient is in AFib with a frequent ectopic beats. 
Okay, what do you say? <laughs> I think this was also covered in our full version of the guideline, and the recommendation is to average. Uh, you know, so in um, in AFib, I'm not sure about a frequent ectopic beats, but in a patient with uh, atrial fibrillation, and especially if there's a wide R to R interval uh, differences, then the recommendation was to average multiple beats. Okay. Uh, I would kind of do it both ways. One is averaging. Another one is a very short cycle beat. That means it's a low flow state because there's not enough filling to occur. And uh, so I would take a long cycle beat uh, also, and the gradient and pressure half time might be affected a little bit. So the best thing is probably to average consecutive beats, not chosen beats, consecutive beats. Any other question? They are good questions. Yeah. Um, so uh, the next question is, calcification causing increased gradient and stenosis. It's not actually a question. Um, calcification. Yeah, calcification causing increased gradient and stenosis. Okay. I, I uh, wonder whether you're talking about non-rheumatic mitral valve abnormalities. You know, particularly elderly people with severe mitral annular calcium and the calcium and fibros can uh, encroach on the mitral valve completely and producing hemodynamically and functionally mitral stenosis. In that scenario, probably the most useful uh, is uh, pressure gradients and how it behaves with uh, stress. Uh, Fibrodegenerative mitral stenosis, non-rheumatic mitral stenosis is pretty common. And so we just have to go by the anatomy and also the gradient. And uh, uh, th those kind of patients generally have abnormal diastolic function. And so the pressure half time method uh, probably is not that reliable. So anatomy, my friend. And that's it. We are right on time on the hour. Okay. Thank you, folks. Thank you to listening to us. And I wish there was a two-way communication, in which case we would have learned from you. But nevertheless, thanks for spending a little part of your life with us. Thank you.